Um, I was reflecting back as preparing for this message. I thought about 30 years ago. That's quite a, quite a while ago. How many folks were not born 30 years ago? Okay, yeah, okay, good, good. Oh, well, the rest of you folks are classic. You're vintage. Okay, yeah, yeah, you know, experienced in life. Well, 30 years ago, um, my wife and I, we attended a conference in, in L.A., and it was in uh, Van Nuys, and uh, uh, this church called uh, Church on the Way. And the pastor's name was Jack Hayford. And um, he had this pastor, a yearly pastor's conference where they, they would invite about maybe 5,000 different pastors to come and attend, to be encouraged, to be built up. And especially in that time in 1989 and later 80s, there was a lot of controversy that was going on. Um, the Berlin Wall had fallen. Um, there were a lot of scandals in the religious circles, televangelists. All these things were going on. And uh, bringing a, like a negative impact on, in terms of the uh, way Christianity was, was um, viewed in society. So uh, Pastor Hayford said, um, we need to have, and this was the title of the conference, a, 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 an agenda for a final decade. A final decade, yeah. The 90s were the last decade before we went to the year 2000, the millennium. So he said, you need to have faith. You've got to have worship. You need to move forward. You know, my wife and I were married in um, 1987, and it's been two years. We, we, we wanted a child. We wanted a child. We prayed. We went to the doctor. We took whatever we needed to take. We did our homework, but nothing you guys, you guys can think, what does that homework? You know, you got to gotta do more than pray in order to have kids. So we did our homework. Okay, you got it now, okay? You got it now. We did our homework, but nothing happened. Nothing happened. So we attend this conference, and on one of the, one of the nights, and many of you heard this story before. I'm just going to tell it again because it was just before that final decade. So it's about Thanksgiving time, and the speaker is John Wimber. He started the Vineyard uh, a ministry that's across the world. And John spoke, and boy, that guy was boring. He was really, you know, he, I mean, if you listen to him, it's like, oh my gosh. But at the end of his message, he got really quiet, and he said, got real quiet. And then he um, said, I have, a, I have a prophetic word. Now, that word pro prophecy really means that God speaks to human vessels. And he was known as like a, like a prophet or someone that heard the voice of God and spoke specific things to a specific people or place and time. So John said, I have a picture, and it was right around Thanksgiving, and he used this big word, and we always studied this in Farrington because I graduated from the higher levels of education in Hawaii. So Farrington, you just word cornucopia. Anybody know what a cornucopia is? I mean, yes, yeah, because there's a lot of Farrington people here. But really, that's, that, that's called the horn of plenty during Thanksgiving. And normally in the cornucopia, they put like uh, kobocha, just for our, our aging. You know, there's the pumpkins, and there's corn, and it shows, it's supposed to represent the blessing of God during that season, Thanksgiving time. But this time, instead of seeing those kinds of fruit, he saw little babies flowing out of this, this horn of plenty. Whoop, whoop, all these babies coming out. So then he said, there are many of you out here in, in the congregation that you're having trouble with uh, infertility. You want children, but you can't have children. Wow. And I just told her our situation. So Norma and, I, we, Norma and I, we stood up, along with several hundred other couples, walking down to the front. And this is a famous church at that time. They had all these movie stars. And, and we, oh, look, there's Pat Boone. And for, the, for you vintage people, you know who that is. <laughs> Pat who? <Ooh>, young people. <laughs> and all these stars, and walking down and walking with Norma, but at the end, he prays for us, okay? He prays for us. And with, with, with prayer and faith and believing and doing our homework, you know, Norma and I, we conceived. And in, in, in August, the next year, in, in uh, 1990, August, my daughter, Joelle, she's not on team today, she, she was born. So out of that barrenness, out of that uh, tumultuous time for us, fruitfulness came. Now, we're on another precipice of going into another decade. Now, as you move into that, maybe not babies, but there's a dream for many of you folks that you've been holding on to, but it hasn't got, been brought to fruition. In fact, there's a lot of uh, opposition. A lot of naysayers that it'll never work. Why even try? Do something else. But maybe you need to hold on to that dream. Hold on to that thing that maybe you've heard God say to you, trust in me. Trust in me. 
Because if you step into this next year, this next decade with faith and expectation, you'll see the reality of what you've been birthing inside, what you've been feeling inside. So let's pray as we begin this message. Father, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. We pray that you give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear and hearts to perceive all that you have prepared for those that love you. And God, we declare this morning as we've sung that we love you, we worship you, we need you. So thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So we are at a doorway, a gate into this, this next year. So how you leave 2019 will determine how you enter into the next year. So how will we go? How will we go through? Well, let me give you a scripture. Okay, this is a key scripture for today. It's found in Psalms 118, verse 19 to 21, and verse 29. It says, Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you have answered me. You have become my salvation. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. I like this translation, the New King Jimmy Version. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. We want to go through, to go through and to praise, praise God. You know, Psalms 118, although there's not a, an author that's written in the Bible, that, that, excuse me, that, that's uh, a claim to Psalms 118, most Bible scholars say it's probably King David. It's probably King David because that psalm was used at, 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 at a dedication of a temple. And the background of this psalm, although it sounds, wow, open the gates of righteousness, I will give thanks to the Lord because he is good. It sounds so positive. Doesn't it sound really good? But the reality, there was a lot of trouble and a lot of turmoil that was facing King David. Let's look at, let's look at verse 5. When hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord, and he brought me into a spacious place. Let me ask you, how many folks have ever been pressurized? Yeah, you've been pressurized. Uh, you, you felt claustrophobic. Anybody felt like you got hemmed in and squeezed and in, 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 in so much that you just, I just cry out to God. Or maybe you haven't yet and you still feel squeezed. Well, the writer said, I cried out to the Lord, you know, in a, in a, in a prior place where I was at. That was my situation. The expectation and the way things were done, for me, I felt like I was getting squeezed, squeezed, pressurized in a place where I basically lost who I was. I was just being obedient, but yet my spirit was crushed and kind of destroyed inside of me. Phones would ring, and, I, and it's, this, it's the classic symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic syndrome. I was experiencing those things. My heart would race. I'm like, that's not a good place. How many folks would recognize that that's not a good place to be at? And you don't, don't raise your hand, but some of us, we have gone through those situations. You know, you know I never served in the military. For those of you who have serving, served or serving in the military, God bless you. Well, last night we had a bomb go off near our house. It's called fireworks. <laughs> I saw the flash, and then I heard the boom. I'm like, whoa. And Norma came out. Did you hear that? Yep, I heard that. That was pretty close. And from what, from what I hear, for those who served in Vietnam quite a while ago, the fireworks really trigger a cascade of these negative emotions, stress-related um, symptoms that happen. Now, when we look at the next, this is, this is, this is a scripture we're reading. Verse 6 and 7, it says, The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere, mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He's my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. I will not be afraid. Now, how many of you ever read the Bible and God or an angel tells whoever they're talking to, don't be afraid? You know, you know different ones in the Bible? In, in the local Bible, no scared. Hey, no scared, huh? No, be afraid. Well, the reason why the angel or the Lord appears and says, don't be afraid, was because 
there's stuff to be afraid of. <laughs> Does that make sense? Don't be afraid, but there, there are like several armies right around you that's ready to destroy you. Oh, don't be afraid you're, you're sieged in, in a... Yeah, there are reasons to be afraid. And if we're honest, we face fear on a regular basis. But in this context, it says, what? I will not be afraid because the Lord is with me. And if you're going through a situation now, you're a little fearful. Maybe a change in job, change in, uh, you know, change in your career. Maybe it's a relationship and you're afraid. Remember the statement, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with me. What can mere, mere mortals do? Verse 8 and 9 says, it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. How many folks have been disappointed or let down by human beings? You've been like that, you know? I mean, you made some promises. They're broken or never kept. You're betrayed. Maybe uh, backstabbed. Wow, that, those are painful experiences. And look at the second part. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Uh, how many anybody, anybody been uh, distrustful of government nowadays? We live in a, a such a, a divided country. The political climate is so adversarial. Red states, blue states, CNN. <laughs> Any of you participate in Twitter with Twitter or Instagram? If you watch that, it's not a civil place anymore. A lot of vilification. Oh, see, that's another Farrington word. That means stink talk, badness. I have to make it normal. There's a lot of things going on. Government. What recently happened with President Trump, in the, at least in the House of Representatives? They voted to what? Impeach him as a kid. What is that impeach? It's like, like Momotaro. Peach. Oh, sorry for you guys know Japanese. Yeah. It's like, what does impeachment mean? It means like they, got, they want to remove him. They, they, they found him guilty of certain things. So the whole government and the perspective of our, of our ethos, of our, of our nation is so divided. And this is not a political statement. What I'm saying is it's the reality where we live. But it brings to light what this scripture is talking about, where we live. In verse 12, they say, They swarm around me like bees or like enemies. They were consumed quickly as like burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down like bees. How many folks are really cool around bees? Are you guys really cool? You like bees? You know, you ever been driving and you had a bee in your car? Oh, yeah. Oh, hey, what's up, bee? Does anybody get a little scared about bees? How about a swarm of bees? You know, in our apartment, our neighbor's apartment, Bees happen to make a hive and a nest, and they have to clean it out. So, you know, the best way, you whack them right now. <laughs> Whatever they did. One day I was in the kitchen, I saw the bees swarming. I mean, like, whoa, and I was so cool. Oh, look at the bees. Wow. No, no, I was like, whoa, bees. You know, when, when, um, when bees come around us, what happens is there are neuro neurotransmitters that happen and, and chemicals flood us and we get afraid, adrenaline, and everything speeds up and you can't think straight. How, how many folks have ever experienced that? Later in life, uh, more and more people experience panic attacks. It feels like bees flying around and we can't think straight. Like, ah! Oh, was that a bee? No. <laughs> we are in a situation where so many things are going wrong. Globally, locally, politically, racially, spiritually, a lot of divisiveness. So how can we change this? There's a saying that we use. It says, think globally, right? Think about the whole world. But act what? No, act locally. Act locally. And what I'm going to talk about is, yes, we're going to think about the world, but change starts with us. Starts with us starts with us. It's a powerful solution. It's giving thanks. That sounds, well, that's so innocuous. That's so lame. How am I going to change my, word by, my world by giving thanks? I mean, look, Psalms 118, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever.
ever. Can you read that with me? Read it together. Ready? Begin. Give. Now, can, can we say the middle section for he is good, like, like better than Campbell's soup? For those of you who know that, it's like, mm-mm. What? Good. Okay. On, on a count of three, I want you to say he is good, but w- with a really good good. One, two, three. He is what? No, the, you know, spread it out. He is good. Yeah. Is, is, is God good? Because when we realize how good God is, the bees, all these other things that face us, they're not going to be as big as they were before. We realize and we recognize reality. Those things are happening. Financial crisis, political turmoil. But when we start to give thanks, it puts in a place of humility. It puts us in a place of, of opportunity to receive from God His blessing, His, His nearness. So give thanks to the Lord for what? He is what? Oh, that's, that's a little bit better. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, Jesus is good to the last drop. No, you know another one. Like that. This is a coffee term. <laughs> He's good. Why? Why should we give thanks to God? Well, he's good. <laughs> and when we, you know, when, when we realize the goodness of God in our lives and around each other, we cannot help but want to re- worship God. You know, I, I stand, I have the privilege of standing on this platform pretty much every week. And I look at you folks, wonderful people here at Grace, amazing people, and amazing stories of God's grace. You know, I, 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 I've, I see people that have gone through divorce. I've seen people have gone through a lot of change and financial situation, relationships that, that have been broken, and yet they still come to church. Yet they still come to worship God. It's easy when everything's good. Right? Isn't it easy to worship God when it's offshore breeze, Glassy, three to four feet. No people allowed except for your friends. For those of you who are surfers, you know what I'm talking about. It's nice. Or you're standing, you're going to go to your restaurant, their favorite restaurant, and there's no line. I mean, it's it's a crazy day, and and you head to you head to Whole Foods, and there's sale there. That's impossible. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, everything is is wonderful. It's easy to give praise during that time, but when it's difficult, and when I see Different ones. The challenges they face, and knowing this, the backstory, and seeing the stories they're going through, and seeing them stand and give praise to God. When I know pain is going through their body. When I know they're, 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 they lost a loved one earlier this year. I see that and say, God, you are so good. When we see the goodness of God, this is what happens in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says this, I urge you, Brothers and sisters, in the light of God's mercy, God's goodness, God's faithfulness, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So when we see how good God is, God's mercy is poured out on a daily basis, and we take time to think about that, how can we not give praise? How can we not sing, your praise will ever be on my lips, despite situations, hardships? Why give thanks? How about when give thanks? When do we give thanks? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything, give thanks. Notice it doesn't say for everything. Give thanks. It's a big difference. Big difference. See, when when, when my wife was diagnosed with cancer several years ago, I'm not thanking God for cancer. Thank you, God, for cancer. That's stupid. That's a crazy statement. But I could thank God that he's with her, with us in this cancer season. That's a big difference. You know, when tragedy happens, I don't thank God for tragedy. But I thank God in that tragedy that out of death can come life. Out of despair can come hope. There's a big difference. So when, when, and many of us, we are going through difficult situations, strained relationships, financial challenges, but can we do this? 
in everything, give thanks. Now, I'm not trying to make this message, you know, kind of, what a downer message. I was hoping to be encouraged today. And he's just talking about bad things. Well, let me encourage you some more. In 1967, this study came out, and it, it, it talks about social readjustment rate, rating scale. What this is, is when people go through hard situations in their lives, they gave a rating score for several things in order to tell how much stress people are going through. And you can rate yourself as I go through some of these things, but here's the results. If there's less than 150 life change units, there's a 30% chance of suffering from stress. Okay? If it's 150 to 299 life change units, there's a 50% chance of suffering from stress. Now, if there's greater than 300 life-changing units, that means a person has an 80% chance of developing stress-related illness, high blood pressure, heart attack, all these things. Now, see how I'm encouraging you here? Let's, let's look at some of these things. These are the top 10. They got a lot of them, but these are the top 10. Number one on the list, death of a spouse. I know of people, even in this church, that has happened last year, and I see them come into service still worshiping God. Divorce, marital separation. I know people who've, who are going through that right now, but they show up worshiping, giving God praise. Jail term, death of a close family member, personal injury or illness. Marriage, I thought that was positive. <laughs> Fired at work, marital rec reconciliation, retirement, all these things. And if you are below 150, God bless you. That's fantastic. And they, they rated over a year. But know that there are other people that are going through stress. That's why we as the people of God need to be sensitive to those around us. So we can give his, give his love, give his comfort, give his understanding for those who are going through stress. We face this on a regular basis. Now, okay, that's enough negative stuff. Whew. All right, let's, let's, let's end. Pastor Randy, poof, done. Well, let me give you a, a, a little um, a side note. Why don't you put this next, next uh, slide up? Performance-enhancing substance. How many folks like performance-enhancing substances? Uh, you, don't tell me, you don't have to tell me uh, what substance you're taking. But <laughs> How Thanksgiving gratitude may improve your health. This is from USA Today. I'm going to read this statement. Expressing gratitude improves cardiovascular strength, sleep quality, and more, researchers said. Gratitude enhances performance in every domain that has been examined, psychological, relational, emotional, and physical, says Robert Emmons, a professor and psychologist at the University of California, Davis. This is why it's been referred to as the ultimate performance-enhancing substance. What that means is when we begin to give thanks and we begin to care about the people around us, we start changing our behaviors, our patterns. And what happens when we change our behaviors, biology follows, meaning in terms of our blood pressure goes down. Have you ever noticed when you get angry all the time, it's, it's really easy to get angry faster and faster? I mean, don't raise your hand if that's your situation. But if you learn how to chill out and put various situations, like sometimes when people cut me off in the road, uh, hopefully it's not any of you, but... Um, because we, we live in Middle Line, and there's a lot of opportunity for me to get more holy and more, more, more godlike. So what happens when I get cut off in the road and people drive really crazily, sometimes just to make me, because I get mad too, I think, oh, poor guy, the guy, the guy got to go to the bathroom. I, I, I just think of some strange stuff, so I don't, I don't you know, I want to chase this guy. And sometimes when I do that, I got Norma and Joel, daddy, okay. Thank you, Jesus. It's better than getting mad, right? It's useless. They mean not, we mean nothing to that person. Just bless them. And if we continue that pattern of giving thanks, because it really, it really puts us in a place of humility. Humility. If you are always expecting people to serve you, always expect, expect people to do nice to you, you are going to have a rude awakening. But if, if you can just learn to say, thank you. For, for many people, that's a foreign word. They hear other words being shared at them. We're at Macy's. 
I'm getting some things, and a poor, the poor service person says, I'm by myself, and people are going to go on break, and, I, and we just smile and say, yeah, yeah, you know, it's difficult, but, you know, and we try to lift her life up. That's what Thanksgiving can do, right? So, so you want to get better, relieve stress? A cheerful heart is good medicine. Be thankful. Be thankful. Now, where should we be thankful? In church, right? I, give you, I will give you thanks in the great assembly like this. I will praise you among many people. You know, I'm thankful for, for the worship team. How many folks are thankful for the worship team? Not for me, but for the worship team. I'm really thankful. I mean, we had, I was talking with Rachel and Matt. Uh, we're, we've been praying for Vince, a drummer, for years for a good drummer. So I can give my daughter a break because she had to learn drums because we had no drummers at that time. So thank you, Joelle. I thank you. I thank, I thank God for my wife and Norma. My, my wife and Norma. My wife, Norma. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's double. Yeah, that's double Thanksgiving. Okay. <laughs> I'm thankful for Norma and, and Joelle because of their sacrifice. Over the years, follow me all over the place. And when they're sick and, you know... Uh, Joel said, hey, do you want me to play um, keyboards today? I said, no, 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 you need to rest. Your, your neck is still, you know, just relax. But she has a heart to serve. I'm so thankful for that. You know, how many folks are thankful for the, um, the children's ministry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're thankful for children's ministry? You know, I, I, look at, uh, I, look, I look at Keiko and Justin and Sean and Landania and how they're reaching out to a lot of our college students. And the college ministry is growing I mean, the discipleship, it's amazing. And even in the midst of, um, Ladenia is not here today because um, in a couple of days, um, we're doing an office pool, yeah, when the, birth, when the birth of the daughter will be. And I, I pick January 1st, got to be in the morning, yeah, so help her out if she's not getting, <laughs> you got to get Sophia, yeah. So, I mean, to see their sacrifice, and, and I just say, thank you, God, for all these people that work hard, to make this place wonderful so people can hear, who, hear and see and experience how good God has been. Did you feel that this morning in the worship time? You know, it wasn't the 20 minutes or 25 minutes. Yeah, we did a little longer. That was by design so I don't have to speak as long. No, no. But we wanted you to experience this place where, oh, God, you're so good. Man, you're Emmanuel. You're with me. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to go through that to those gates with thanksgiving. Did you sense that? And it's like this, this, this opening, this portal. This sounds really strange. I can get strange, but I am already strange. This portal, this opportunity where God comes, and it seems like heaven, heaven opens up, you know. Man, I could see things, and then I, I'm not going to say them now. But it's amazing. Praise God in the, in, the, in the church. How about praise God among the nations? How many folks have ever gone on a mission trip? Wow. I mean, I, I had an opportunity to travel around and see really prosperous countries. Amazing. You know, going to Japan doesn't seem like I'm on a mission trip. It's so much fun, you know, especially when you eat good, uh, good uh, tonkatsu and uh, all the good. <laughs> but, but it's still a mission trip. It's, it's wonderful. And I've traveled to other places where it's not as prosperous. It's not as fortunate uh, financially. But I see the people there and their worship to God with what little they have. They are so thankful. And we in America, we're so blessed. I mean, I got the iPhone 10. I already want the 11. What the heck is that? Sounds funny, yeah? Many times we, we deal with that kind of things in our lives. So I got to be more thankful. We praise God among the nations. We praise God before other generations. So we, your people, and the sheep of your pasture, We'll give you thanks forever. We will show forth your praise to all generations. Psalm 79, verse 13. Uh, how many folks are parents here? Your parents? Young babies or even older? How many folks want your children to be thankful? Right? You, you want them to be dil diligent, to work hard, to sacrifice, to persevere through, to, to, through adversity. You want all of that. So what do you do? You send them to school, yeah, and you hope it happens. No, 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 no. I'll put this statement up. 
We teach what we know, our minds, but we impart who we are. We teach what we know, but we impart who we are. This is a, this is a, a, a scary uh, experience for me. So when I see my daughter leading worship, I didn't teach her all that stuff, you know, do this. and do She just does it naturally over the years of doing worship. And, and, and she loves doing that. And she, she's making eyes at me. No, yeah, she, she, she can just do that because of the impartation of my life. What's scary is the other side of me, like, oh, I'm a little messy at home. And somehow the impartation maybe, I don't know, maybe might have hit that side of my daughter. See, we impart what we know. No, we, we, we teach what we know, but we impart who we are. So when we give our praises before other generations, we give thanks to our difficult situations. Our kids are watching. They'll see. Young people will see whether it's real or just a show. Let's be real people of thanksgiving. The last section as the worship team comes up. How? How will we give thanks? This is a really good book. It came out in October, and it's probably going to be a really good seller. It's by Rebecca Lyons. It's called Rhythms of Renewal. Um, I'm not going to uh, go into a lot of the deta details of it because there's very, a lot of chapters, but very simple how to apply these principles so we can be more thankful and have less stress. Okay? Number one. Reflect. Reflect. Create space and solitude in your daily schedule to slowly evaluate and redefine priorities. You know, we had a whole series called Breathing Space. How many folks enjoyed that? I mean, great, great series. Learning how to, in your finance, breathing space in that area. Your, your time. Your morality. Keeping space so we can hear clearly when everything's cluttered, when everything's uh, smashed around it. We, we, don't, we don't think properly. We don't think properly. Number two, these are all ours. Number two, remove. Remove. Remove unnecessary distractions, associations, etc. The decluttering of our soul is much more important than tidying up our surroundings. The, de the decluttering of our souls. Now, I, I didn't say either or, okay? It's, you know, for sometimes we had, the, we had the young people in the second service. So, oh, I'm, I'm decluttering my soul, mom and dad. So Pastor Randy said that in the message. So that's why my bibbities and my socks are all over the floor. But I'm taking care of my soul. It's not either or. It's both and. But make the priority of getting the clutter out of our lives, out of our minds, so we can think, we can process, we can move forward with gratitude. Number three, restore Restore important disciplines you know you should be doing concerning your spiritual, emotional, and physical health. Start with one discipline and take it slow. Take it slow. How many folks uh, plan, intend, or thinking about losing weight or get, uh, getting to shape in 2020? Anybody? Uh, you intend, and I'm not saying you're doing it, okay? You intend, <laughs> you intend to do that. Uh, who owns gym memberships? Anybody? All right, who he intends to go to the gym? Sometimes we, it's really hard. How about let's do this? You intend to go to the gym and just go for five minutes. What a waste of time. No, no, you're creating a habit, a discipline. Go five minutes and then leave. And the next day, go five minutes again, or if even more so. Who uses the elliptical or the treadmill at gyms? Anybody do that? I, I do that. So maybe you, if you don't do that, how about just putting on your shoes? You put your shoes on and say, wow, I got my shoes on today. All right, that's good. Take them off. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but if you want to develop new skills or new disciplines, it's little steps, incremental steps. Many of you, uh, years gone by, you went back into your, your physical exercise regimen and you did two hours for the first time. Anybody did something like that? I'm just going to go for it. And then what happened the next week? Uh, less and <laughs> less. Oh, not even because you're all sore. Take your time. Now, this uh, ne next month we're having the Every Nation Prayer and Fasting Consecration Time. January 6th to 10th. It's a time where all of like the Pastor Bruce's church and other churches that we relate to in Every Nation, we get together and we seek God for His direction, for His purpose, for His blessing. 
we seek God for himself. And we're providing some prayer pockets throughout the week. And here, here they are, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I want to invite you. And, and Grace Group leaders, if you haven't brought your um, Grace Groups to sign up yet, please sign up so we can come to pray together. Because it's a great time of worship, a great time of focusing our attention, our prayer toward seeing God's kingdom come established through our lives. And it's a great way to start our prayer for our individual lives. And number four, last R, reach out. It's great. We have a great time here. This, this service, there's a lot of people here. But there are more people that need to know who you are, who God is. I'm going to show you a, I want to show you a video of someone who reached out and touched other people's lives because it's about not just ourselves, the whole world. Before I was asked to go to church, I was going around the city exploring for a, pro a design project. Um, and then I decided to take a rest at one of the benches at school. And then three girls came up to me and they were all like around my age, but they um, did a God test on me. Um, nothing really serious. It was more like, um, do you believe in God? Or like, what do you think your purpose is? Um, they asked me to go to church after that. They turned out to be also like design students. It was really a difficult, I guess, transition in my life, trying to get accustomed to being in a whole new country all by myself, not knowing anyone. But my roommates happened to be busy that weekend and it was just me by myself in the, the room. And so I was reminded that um, these girls invited me to church. And so I was like, you know, might as well go, there's nothing really else to do. And then because I felt so lonely and so empty that this presence of being in the church really like filled my heart. And they were closing in prayer and they asked for those who weren't a follower of Christ if they would decide to follow them today. And um, they're counting down from five. And then I remember from like five, four, and I was like, I don't know if I want to do it. And like three, I was like, I want to do it. And then when they were on the second, second, I heard a voice, I like, I should do it. And then so at one, I raised, I rose my hand. I was like, and then I started, <laughs> started crying after for, I don't know what reason, but yeah, that's how I was saved. Um, but yeah, after seeing Ashley actually commit her life to Christ, she has grown like so much. She was just very hungry to know Christ and just to really understand who He is and how, I guess, He works through her life. And I feel like she's been able to really experience His presence and like the Holy Spirit working through her that it just keeps driving her to learn more and more. Yeah, I don't think I could have done it without Haley, um, mm -hmm. my start in this journey with Christ and, um, you know, with grace. But I don't think I could have been as faithful or, like, as confident um, if it weren't for um, Haley and our friendship. It starts with gratitude. It starts with saying thank you. Yes, to God and to others. For the things that God has blessed us with the relationship that God has given us, whether it's stressed or not, that will help us. That will bring the change in our heart. 